Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome back to another lecture in American government. Hope you had a good weekend. Uh, all right. Uh, today, we start a new segment on uh, elections elections and campaigns in the United States of America. So Roman numeral one, presidential versus congressional elections. All right, write it down. A presidential election is an election where we have one president running for office. We have 435 House members running for office and one third of the senators running for office. We call that a presidential election, even though there are members of Congress running, okay? It's known as a presidential election. So in 2020, we had a presidential election. Now, uh, in 2022, write it down, there will be a congressional election. In a congressional election, you have 435 House members running for office, and you have the second third of the senators running for office. So 2022 is a congressional election. And then 2024 is a presidential election. You have a president running for office. Uh, we don't know if Biden is gonna run again or maybe he's too old or uh, maybe uh, Kamala Harris would run instead of him, who knows? But 2024, we will have a presidential election, a president running for re-election. Uh, we have 435 House members, and then the third third of members of the Senate. And then the cycle repeats. You get the idea? Clear? Good. Now. Write it down. The difference, the main difference between a presidential election and a congressional election is as follows. A, the size of voter turnout. Size of voter turnout. In a presidential election, there is a higher turnout than in a congressional election. On average, on average, a presidential election has somewhere around 55% voter turnout, right? Now, in 2020, it was unusually high at about, this is an estimate, we don't have final numbers yet, at about 67%. Again, why? Well, Donald Trump was running for office, all right? And he's a polarizing figure. A lot of people hated him and went out in droves to vote against him. In fact, if you look at the exit polls, this is very interesting, uh, majority of the people who voted for Biden didn't vote for Biden, they voted against Donald Trump, okay? By contrast, the majority of people who voted for Donald Trump actually voted for Donald Trump and not against Biden. 
You understand what's going on here? Because Trump was such a polarizing figure, he brought out the high voter turnout, 67%. Now, what is the voter turnout usually in a congressional election? The voter turnout in a congressional election usually is between 35 to 40%. Yeah, so a majority of the people say at home, they don't vote in a congressional election. Again, in 2018, because there was Donald Trump, right, people came out in droves to vote against the Republican Party. Okay, in 2018. And the voter turnout went up to 50%. 50%. And Democrats gained control of the House of Representatives as a result. Okay? So, voter turnout uh, is usually higher in a presidential election than in a congressional election. Second point that we need to make is competition. Write it down. Uh, presidential elections are far more competitive than congressional elections. Far more competitive than congressional elections. Uh, a president rarely wins rarely wins more than 55% of the popular vote. It's very rare, okay, to win more than that. By contrast, in the House of Representatives, the re-election rate of House members is somewhere around 93%. So 93% of those who run get re-elected in a House election. Let me show you the data. Uh, this is data taken from a website called Open Secrets. Dot org. If you want data about money in elections, voting turnout, uh, re-election rates, etc., etc., this is where you go. OpenSecrets.org. So let's interact with this and look at the numbers. All right. So this is the re-election rates for the U.S. House between 1964 and 2018, right? Uh, in 2018, 91% got re-elected. Uh, 2016, 96.7%. Uh, 2014, 95.4%. Uh, 2012, 89.8%, and so on. Notice that Almost all of the time, it's above 80%. If you take the numbers from 1964 all the way to 2018 and you average them, you get 93% re-election rate. So basically, in other words, only 7%, 7% from 1964 to 2018 actually did not get re-elected. This is how much lack of competition there is in elections at the House level, all right? Now, this 7% is also misleading because <clears throat> if you exclude those who decided not to run and those who died in office and you want to find out the people who actually lost their seat, you get somewhere around 3 to 5%. Okay, so actual competition, actual seats that are competitive in the House of Representatives is somewhere around 3 to 5% of the total 435 seats that are up for election every two years. Okay, so this is the House. Now, if we scroll down 
to the Senate. What do we find in the Senate? Well, in the Senate, it is more competitive. So the Senate, write it down, the Senate is more competitive than the House. Still, still, if you look at the numbers in the Senate between 64 and 2018, something around 81% got reelected. 81%. So the turnover percentage is about 19%. Again, more competitive than the House, but that not much competitive overall. All right? So when 81% get reelected, you really have little to no competition in congressional elections. Now, here is the issue here. Uh, the approval rating, the approval rating of Congress is not that high, okay? Let me show you. Let me show you the numbers of the approval rating of the House of Representatives. Okay, here we are. All right, here it is. Let's interact with it. Interact. No, not this one. This one. There we go. So, if you look at the approval rating of uh, House and Congress, which is Senate and House together, Congressional Job Approval Rating, a website called Real Clear Politics, they take all the poll numbers and they average them out, which, as I told you, is the best way to read polls. Now, let's look at the most recent approval rating. Only 29.3% approve of how members of Congress are doing their job, All right? Now, if you look before that, for a long time, it was in the teens between 10 and 20%. Now it gone up to 30%, okay? So basically, you have 59.7% who disapprove of the way members of Congress are doing their job. And yet, and yet, they get reelected by such large numbers. So how do we square the circle? How is it possible for the public to hate Congress, as we can see by the numbers, and yet these members of Congress get reelected over and over and over again? Okay? They have job security. They stay there for almost ever. Some of them die in office. So how does that work out? So here is what's going on. Here is uh, the issue. Why uh, members of Congress are hated in public polling, yet they get reelected between 81 to 93 percent of the time, depending on the chamber that we are talking about. All right. Number one, while people dislike, dislike Congress as a whole, they like their own individual member of Congress. So on the one hand, they hate Congress as a whole. They believe Congress as a whole is a bad institution, doesn't do the job of the American people, they believe that their individual member of Congress is great. So that's one. Number two, members of Congress have name recognition. They are well-known. You do know about Kamala Harris because she used to be a senator, okay? You know about Joe Biden because he used to be a senator and later vice president. They have name recognition. And name recognition make, 
people vote for you. All right? They're well known. You all know about Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, the House of Representative members from New York. Okay? You know about Bernie Sanders. He's a senator too. Well-known person. So they have name recognition. The third reason, the third reason why they get re-elected in such large number, even though people hate Congress, is that incumbents, those who are already in office, get the large majority of campaign contributions, the money that they use to get elected, campaign contribution. In 2018, get ready for this, in 2018, incumbents received 88%, 88% of all interest group contributions. That is a huge number. So now you understand why, on the one hand, the people are not fond of Congress, 30% approval rating. And at the same time, these members of Congress keep re-elected, keep getting re-elected by 81% to 93%, depending on the chamber. All right. Roman numeral number two, running for president, okay, running for president, point A, the usual suspects, you know, if you uh, ever watched the classic movie Casablanca, which I am very fond of, uh, every time uh, there is a crime, uh, the person, uh, the French p police officer in charge of uh, the uh, of Casablanca, which is a city in in Morocco, he always goes out and says, "Round up the usual suspects." Right. So, who are the usual suspects who run for president? Are they like ordinary folks like you and me? Hell no. So who are they? Here are their demographics. Usually, usually white. Usually males. Usually middle-aged or older. By the way, Biden is the oldest person to ever assume the presidency. Yep. Older, <clears throat> usually high income, they make good money, usually well-educated, usually married with children, oftentimes trot their family with them as props to show how they are family oriented. Usually involved in politics, right? They have been in politics for a long time as former governors, former vice presidents, former senators or even current senators, okay? So if you look at the candidates, uh, it came down in uh, the uh, Democratic primary to two candidates, two old white men. One, Bernie Sanders, and the other, Joe Biden. Both are senators, 
right? Both are well income. Biden was vice president to Obama for eight years. Both involved in politics for a very long time. Both married with children. Okay. Both well educated. You get the idea. On the other side, you had Trump. Again, white, male, high income, educated, okay, degreed, older, kids, not involved in politics. He doesn't tick that mark. All right. On occasion, on occasion, you have a minority a black man or a black woman that gets the nomination and wins the presidency. And if you want to win, if you want to win, um, you need to be a centrist, someone who represents the boring middle, not too far to the right, not too far to the left, a centrist. Obama was a centrist and so is Biden. In a uh, fit of honesty, uh, Biden was caught on a hot mic telling donors, and I quote, if I get elected, nothing will fundamentally change. Okay? So I will basically tinker around the margin, but I will not change things radically. I will not offer universal health care as in Medicare for all. Okay, I will not do that. I will take care of the pandemic because this is very important. Uh, vaccine distribution, etc., etc. But nothing will fundamentally change. Is this clear? All right. B, getting started. Getting started. Running for president running for president usually begins at least two years before the election. We have one of the longest, if not the longest, election campaign seasons. Really ridiculously long. Okay? So, it begins two years prior to the actual election. At that point, number one under getting started, a process known as testing the waters begins. This is where, write it down, various candidates potential candidates, test the feasibility of them becoming president. They create an exploration committee, and they start asking potential donors if they will give them money should they run. Okay? They will do focus groups to see if they should run. Stuff like that. Step number two. Step number two. <clears throat> is getting mentioned by the media. By the media as someone who has presidential aspirations, someone who has 
presidential presence, gravitas. Okay? So, in 2024, if Biden decides to run, he will be the only candidate running for the Democratic Party. If he doesn't, there are many others who are potential candidates, all right? Maybes. Um, in the Republican side, you might have the governor of Florida. In the Democratic side, you might have the governor of California having a presidential aspiration. Clear? So, third, when you get started, you need money. Lots and lots of money. Write it down. It is often said that money is the mother's milk of American politics. Mother's milk. How important is mother's milk? Very. How important is money in American politics? Very much so important. So, as a candidate, you and your campaign must start raising money as soon as possible, as quickly as possible. Now that the numbers are trickling in from the 2020 election, I am going to give you an astounding number. The cost of the 2020 election, Congress and the presidency, candidate spending and outside spending was $14.4 billion. $14.4 billion to elect a corpse known as Joe Biden. This is the most expensive U.S. election in history. Now, direct spending, not overall spending, not the $14.4 billion, direct spending by the Biden campaign, so by money raised by them and spent by them, was about $1 billion, $1.04 billion to be exact. And direct spending by the Trump campaign was $774 million. So the Biden campaign outspent the Trump campaign. The rest of the $14.4 billion were spent on congressional elections and spent by outside groups known as super PACs, also known as independent expenditures. We will talk about this. In the next election, in the next lecture, I'm sorry. So you have to raise a lot of money and you have to keep raising that money. And if you fall behind, what do you do? You drop out. Okay. Final reason under the uh, getting started is campaign organization. The money, write it down, 
the money is needed for two basic reasons. You need to spend on media advertising, whether on television or the internet, social media. You need to do that. And you also need to create an effective campaign organization that can get you elected. Okay? Find out on your own who is included, who is included, the people included, in a campaign organization. Clear? Good. Roman numeral number three, money and elections. Money and elections. So I'm going to give you some numbers. You don't have to write them down. Just note the trend in the numbers. Here we go. 1996, 2.2 billion was spent on federal election. 2.2 billion. 2000, number went up to 3.1 billion. 2004 went up to 4.1 billion. 2008, 5.3 billion. 2012, 6.3 billion, 2016, 6.5 billion, and get ready for this, 2020, 14.4 billion dollars. That is a 121% increase over 2016. Crazy, yo. Crazy amount of money is being spent. Let me show you. So this is the uh, breakdown of the 2020 uh, elections, again, taken from uh, opensecret.org. Uh, 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 let's interact with this, shall we? All right. So if you look at the numbers, uh, you can see that presidential spending was 5.7 billion, uh, congressional spending was 8.7 billion. Okay, so there was far more congressional spending than there was presidential spending. Uh, why is that? Well, in large part because of the Georgia Senate election, which was a very expensive election, as you recall. Uh, the there were two runoff elections in Georgia because the election was very close between the Democrat and the Republican, and they had a January runoff, and the uh, Democrats were able to win the two Senate seats in Georgia by a very close margin, and uh, then Congress was controlled by Democrats, both the House and the Senate, as a result of this election were controlled by Democrats, and now the president is also Democratic. So we have unified government right now at the moment. Again, this is not going to last. Uh, probably 2022, uh, Democrats will uh, lose control, either the House or the Senate, or both, because that's what usually happens in a midterm election for the incumbent's party. They lose control of the Senate or the House or both. Uh, again, Democrats in 2020 heavily outspend the Republicans, right? Uh, 8.4 billion to 5.3 billion in 2020. And uh, here's like large individual contributions and small uh, donors. You can see their number 7.5 billion versus uh, 4.065 billion. So anyway, a lot of money has been spent, and there's a lot of spending by outside groups. This is, I told you about the outside group spending. Uh, so uh, this is uh, the most important and most expensive election that we have had 
in a very long while. All right. Okay, so um, uh, how does uh, U.S. spending compare to other similarly advanced countries uh, on elections? Okay, so let's talk about spending per vote. How much does each vote cost? And let's talk about 2016, okay, spending per vote. So in 2016, uh, the cost of one vote, so you take the number of votes, you take the number of amount of money spent, and you divide them by each other, and you get a number. So the cost per vote in the United States was $47. So to have uh, people vote, it costs $47 per vote, right? Uh, what about other countries? Canada. Canada spends $17 per vote. Not $47 per vote, $17 per vote. So they spend much less than we do. The United Kingdom spends $6 per vote. $6 per vote. Uh, Germany. Germany spends two dollars per vote now why is it lower in these country than the United States well there they have public financing of elections okay so uh, another thing is US elections are very long like in 2016 2016 the length of the election was 597 days 597 days. So during that time period, you could have held, ready for this, this 597 days, seven Canadian elections. Canadian elections are five to 10 weeks. 14 British elections, six weeks long. 14 Australian elections, Australian elections are five weeks long. 41 French elections. French election campaigns are two weeks long. And 55-0 Japanese elections. Japanese elections are 12 days long. Okay? So by the time we hold one election, the Japanese could have held 50 elections. All right. Uh, election campaigns, another reason why it is so expensive in the United States, election campaigns in other countries are either, are either forbidden from advertising on TV or given free airtime, okay? That negates the need to raise and spend a lot of money. And finally, in some countries, as I told you before, there are strict limits on spending. Strict limits on spending, but not limits on contributions. So you can contribute as much money as you want to a candidate of your choice, but the candidate cannot spend it all. So why raise it in the first place? You get the idea? The U.S. does not have any such limits. You can contribute almost as much as you want, and I say almost because we're going to talk about the rules later on, almost as much as you want, and the candidate can spend almost as much, almost as, much as they want. All right. So let's continue under still money and election, a elections for president. Uh, let's look at some numbers. And this is only candidate spending, not outside group. We'll talk about that later. Uh, 2008, 2008, $1.1 billion was spent by candidates only. Uh, 2012, 2012, uh, $1.4 billion by candidates only. 
2016, $1.5 billion by candidate only. And 2020, around, we don't have the final number yet, around 1.8, 1.9 billion by candidates only. So we ask the question, what is the source of the money? Where does the money come from? First, individuals, individual donors. Now, individual donors are of two subtypes. Okay, so private donors, first thing is private donors, and then you have individual donors. So private donors and then individual donors. These individual donors can either be citizens or green card holders. Okay? Damn it. Okay, hold on a minute. So as I was saying, uh, the source of money, there are two of them. Uh, under private donors, you have uh, individuals who can be either citizens or green card holders. And then you have political action committee. Now, what is a political action committee PAC for short? Write it down. A PAC is a private organization uh, created either by a labor union or a corporation to create a PAC. The PAC creator must raise money from at least 50 people, five zero, 50 people, and donate money to at least five federal candidates. Okay? Raise from 50, donate to five. And finally, uh, the PAC must be registered with the Federal Election Commission. All right. In early 2015, there were approximately 7,220 political action committees. So that is one source of money for presidential elections. Uh, the second source of money under small ii, the federal government, okay, the federal government, write it down. During the primary election, the federal government runs a matching funds program. So before we continue, I need to explain what is a primary election. All right, what does that mean? Write it down. A primary election is an election within each major political party, within the Republican Party, within the Democratic Party. Okay? election within the party where registered party members vote vote on a state by state basis on a state by state basis to determine who will be who will be the candidate in the general election Okay, so um, in this election cycle that just passed, 
2020. You had, get ready for this, 22 candidates running as Democrats wanting to be the candidate who will run in the general election. So the primary began in January of 2020 and ended in June of 2020. And the 22 who were running were whittled down to one. And that one person who became the Democratic Party candidate was Joe Biden. Okay? That is known as a primary. You got it? All right. So during the primary, the federal government runs a matching funds program. So what does that mean? The federal government will match individual donations, individual donations, as long as the donation is not larger than $250. Okay? Now, why this small number, $250? The point is to encourage people with average means of donating money to candidates. So the federal government will match that number. So let's say, for the sake of argument, I went ahead and I gave $100 to the Bernie Sanders campaign in the primary in 2020. How much does he end up with? He ends up with $200. 100 from me and 100 from the federal government. In fact, in fact, Bernie Sanders got the overwhelming majority of his contributions from small donors like this. All right? That's what he got his money from. His average size of the donation was the smallest of any of the candidates who were running for office. That means he was getting money from small donors. Now, uh, the money, write it down, is earmarked for that purpose, for the purpose of giving it to presidential candidates. The money is earmarked for that purpose when you file your tax returns and check off the box for the presidential election campaign fund. So when you file your 1040 form for election, assuming you're filing 1040, you can check off a box that says, I wish to allocate $3 of the taxes that I pay that I will never, ever, ever see again to the federal election campaign fund, and it is $3. All right? Next up is election for Congress. Okay? Okay. So let's talk about... Uh, Part B, elections for Congress. Write it down. Uh, winning a seat in Congress is directly related to the amount of money that a candidate spends. So basically, the more you spend, the more likely you will win. Let me give you a number. Between 2000 and 2018, 93% of House members and 81% of Senate candidates who outspent their opponents won. Crazy. 
the average house winner in 2018 spent $2.1 million. So if you spend less than $2.1 million, you are likely to lose. And the average Senate winner spent $15.8 million. So if you spend less than $15.8 million, you lose. In other words, the more money you spend, the more likely you will get elected. So let's do the same thing as we did with the presidential elections, source of the money. Where does the money come from? First, individuals. Write it down. 60% of all contributions to congressional candidates come from individuals. But these individuals are not you and me. They are not ordinary citizens like you and me. Let me show you their numbers. This is the uh, data taken from, again, opensecrets.org, uh, the donor demographics. And it says, let me read it for you, just 1.42% of the United States population contributed more than $200 to federal elections, 1.42%, okay? Uh, PACs, parties, and outside groups, 2019 to 2020, these $4.6 donors, sorry, gave a hefty, 76.07% of all contributions. So if you look at the breakdown by square, you will find the black squares, small individual donors like you and me are only 23.93% and large individual contributors are 76.07%. So uh, what are their demographics? Okay, these large donors that give a lot of money. Here are their demographics. Uh, they are usually less than 1%. Uh, they are usually overwhelmingly males. They are usually white. They are usually older than 45. And they usually make more than $100,000 every year. These are the so-called individual donors, which give 60% of all contributions. Okay, so uh, next source are PAC contributions, political action committees, all right? Write it down, 26% of contributions to members of Congress come from political action committees. Um, there are uh, three kinds of PACs in general. You have the corporate PACs, you have the labor union PACs, and you have the ideological unaffiliated PACs. Unaffiliated means they are not tied to a labor union or a corporation. So, um, corporate PACs, write it down. We're going to focus on corporate PACs and labor union PACs, right? Corporate PACs give 50% of their contributions to Republicans and 50% of their contributions to Democrats. So uh, corporate PACs split it evenly. Remember what I told you <clears throat> in the United States, we have two capitalist parties, 
uh, one has a right-wing social demeanor on social issues, the Republicans, and uh, uh, the other, the Democrats, is also a capitalist party, but it has a social, uh, it has a socially liberal uh, demeanor, okay, on social issues. Issues like abortion, gay rights, etc., etc., etc. But make no mistakes, both of these parties are capitalist parties. You can tell from the donations, right? Corporate PACs give 50% to Democrats, 50% to Republicans. If, as is often said, that the uh, Democrats are against capitalism, then why are they getting money from corporate PACs? It doesn't make sense. All right. By contrast, uh, labor union, labor union PACs give overwhelmingly 80% of their donations to Democrats. 80% of their donations to Democrats. Uh, let me show you. Uh, the chart, again, taken from opensecrets.org. So this is a uh, chart, again, shows us the contributions that each uh, political action committee gives. Uh, let's interact with it, shall we? Okay, here it is. Let's go up. All right, so here is the top 20 PAC contributors to federal candidates, 2019-2020. Uh, 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 again, you can see uh, that uh, National Association of Realtors, eh, almost evenly to Democrats and Republicans, 2 million, 1.9 million, evenly. Uh, National so Beer Wholesale Association, also even. Uh, Credit Union, even AT&T, even American Crystal Sugar, even Comcast, almost even. American Bankers Association, uh, here they give more to Republicans than they do to Democrats. Uh, Operating Engineers Union, give more to Democrats than to Republicans. Sheet Metal, Air, Rail, and Transportation Union, overwhelmingly to Democrats. Majority Committee PAC, this is a non-corporate PAC, it's a non-affiliated ideological PAC, overwhelmingly to Republicans. American Federation of Teachers, Labor Union, overwhelmingly to uh, Democrats. National Auto Associations, right, overwhelmingly to Republicans. And you can see by the color, which is solidly Democratic and which one isn't, that most labor unions and ideological groups give to whatever is, is uh, preferable to them, usually the Democratic Party, if you're a labor union. Now, I want you to find out on your own, find out on your own, which PACs give overwhelmingly to Democrats and which PACs give overwhelmingly to Republicans, right? That is your job. Find it out on your own. So uh, one final source uh, before we adjourn the lecture is self-financing. What is self-financing? Write it down. Uh, self-financing is when a candidate, when a candidate uh, spends on his or her own campaign out of their own pocket, okay? So it's called self-financing. Uh, generally speaking, and this is ironic, right? Uh, generally speaking, self-financed candidates don't do so well in getting elected, okay? They don't do so well in getting elected. So they don't do well uh, in getting elected, as I mentioned. However, however, uh, they can afford to self-finance. So the reason why they can afford to self-finance is because in 2015, 70% of senators were millionaires. 
okay, more than half of members of the House and the Senate are millionaires. Uh, the median net worth, the median net worth of both senators and House members is somewhere above $1.1 million. Let me show you some of the uh, outrageous millionaires in Congress. So this is a uh, article from Open Secrets. Majority of lawmakers in the 116th Congress are millionaires. This was the prior Congress to this one. Not much has changed, trust me. So let's interact with it, shall we? Okay, interact. Here we go. Scroll down. Wealthiest members of 116th Congress. Uh, House, Senate. This is the House member Greg Gianforte, $189 million. That's his net worth. $189 million. Uh, another uh, Republican and another Republican, and then there's a Democrat, $124 million. Here's Nancy Pelosi, the Speaker of the House. Her net worth is about $115 million. So they're very wealthy people. All right, here's the Senate. Look at that. Rick Scott. Net worth, $260 million. Uh, Mark Warner, Democrat, $214 million. That's why when I hear people say, oh, yeah, we got to cut their salaries to teach them a lesson. Really? Teach them a lesson? A man that has $260 million, you're going to teach him a lesson by cutting his salary? Come on, man. So anyway, uh, these are the uh, millionaires in Congress, and you can go to opensecrets.org and just read about it and this article. Okay, we have come to the end of this lecture, and on this note, I will say, as always, bye-bye. <laughs>